Good morning to all of you. Vice Principal Mrs. Nirmala Joseph, my friend K. Raghu, the former president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, and also the alumni of San Joseph's College of Commerce, Secretary of the Alumni Association, Samantha Pasha, my other colleagues in the council, respected teachers, my dear student friends, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Old Students Association, I would like to thank Mr. K. Raghu for accepting our invitation and being here to address the union budget. All of you being the students from the commerce background, you need to know something basics about this budget. I thought I spent two, three minutes to, to, to speak to you on this union budget. If you really see the union budget word is not there anywhere in the Constitution of India. The Constitution talks about the annual financial statement. The annual, annual financial statement what prepared by the union government and presented to the country is termed in the commercial terms as the union budget. I'm sure all of you are aware what the budget is, what is the implications on the economy, and what is the implication on the taxes. And predominantly, you think that when once we talk about the budget, it's only more to do with the taxes. What is the amount of taxes they collect? What is the reduction of taxes they are giving? What is the amount of rebates they are giving? Being a commerce student, at a macro level as well as a micro level, you need to know the economic implications also on this union budget. So I don't think we could have got a better person than Mr. K. Raghu. And K. Raghu has been a person who has instrumental in structuring the Chartered Accountancy course. He is the architect of the designing the education for the Chartered Accountancy course. He is also on the board of the International Federation of Accountants. And it's a great honor to have you, Raghu. And uh, we will have Raghu to address on this union budget. It is an honor for me to introduce our speaker for today. C.A.K. Raghu, senior partner of K. Raghu and Company, has over 25 years of experience as a chartered accountant, having gained deep insights into the profession as a fellow member of the ICAI. He was elected as the Vice President of the ICAI for the year 2013-14 and had been the supreme torchbearer of the Indian accountancy profession in the capacity of the President of the ICAI for the year 2014-15. Acknowledged for his international outlook and drive to promote brand Indian CA globally, he is presently in the League of World Accountancy Leaders serving the profession globally as a member of the Board of International Federation of Accountants. C.A.K. Raghu has represented ICAI at Board of Insurance Regulatory and Developmental Authority, Audit Advisory Board and Government Accounting Standards Advisory Board, both constituted by Comptroller and Auditor General of India, to name a few. As the Central Council Member of ICAI, he promoted XBRL as a member of the ICAI XBRL Committee, facilitated setting up of 14 computer labs for students, oversaw the simplification of the online bank audit form, enabled the launch of a networking portal for members in practice, assisted in digitizing the CA journal. CAK Raghu is a dynamic individual who is known to always make a change wherever he goes. He has made several contributions to the profession, including Cloud Campus and the ICAI mobile app. What makes such a distinguished man one of us is the fact that he is an alumni of our very own college. He completed his BCom in our college and was also a member of the Canada Sangha. It's an absolute honor to have you with us here today, sir. I now request... I now request our Vice Principal, Dr. Nirbala Joseph, to kindly hand over to CA K. Raghu a token of our appreciation.
I now hand over the mic to Mr. C. A. K. Raghu. Good morning, friends. I deem it a great honor and privilege to be amongst you this morning on the occasion of the analysis of the union budget. I would like to thank Vinay Muthunjia, my good friend, who was my senior in the college, for having invited me today to be amongst you to share a few insights on the union budget, the document that every citizen of this great nation looks forward every year. Thank you, Vinay, for having invited me. And I appreciate the excellent work that Vinay has done last year as the immediate past president of the Old Students Association. I am very happy to note that the Old Students Association of the St. Joseph's College of Commerce is doing an excellent job. My compliments to Nirmala Joseph, the Vice Principal of the St. Joseph's College of Commerce, for the excellent way in which she has taken the lead to see that all the courses in this college is a big success. Just now, we were discussing with the principal the kind of popularity your college is having. And the mere fact that three students from your college have got ranks in the recently concluded CA final examination is something uh, my, you know, I can say uh, a very big uh, achievement, I could say. And a lot of credit should go to the teachers and the staff member of St. Joseph's College of Commerce for the excellent way in which they have groomed the students. In fact, my son also is here. Arjun also studies in this college. And I'm very happy that, um, you know, uh, he tells me that this is a very good college. I'm very happy with the college, the campus, etc. I would also like to recognize the presence of Samantha, the secretary of the uh, St. Joseph's Old Students Association, and all the other distinguished faculty members present here. Friends, as Vinay very rightly said, the union budget is one of the most comprehensive reports of the government of India that is prepared every year. And today, we find that all the revenues of the government, the expenditure of the government is all mapped in one place. Most of you would have read this in your in the curriculum, part of your curriculum. All students of commerce, you know what a budget is. But what is very important for you to understand is that how budget would impact the economy, how it would impact each one of us. If you look into the current budget, you will have three major documents. One is the budget estimates for 2018-19 for the year 1st of April 2018 to 31st March 2019. Whatever would be the revenue collections, whatever would be the expenditure, would come in the budget estimates. That is what is estimated by various departments of the government. Then we have the revised estimates for 2017-18. Whenever a budget is prepared, they realize that the funds allocated to a particular department is in insufficient. So they revise the budget. So in the budget document, you have one segment that is known as the revised estimates for the current year 2017, ending in 31st March 18. And then we also have actuals for the year 2016-17. So these are the three components of any budget document. And it is important for you as students of commerce to understand that all these documents are very important for you to get a good reading of what is happening in our country. Friends, in addition to this, when I wanted me to talk on the fact how a budget is formulated, as you know, it's a very important document. A lot of effort is put in by the union government, the Ministry of Finance, and the Department of Economic Affairs under the Ministry of Finance takes the lead in formulating the union budget. Exactly this year, for the first time, the budget was presented on the 1st of February 2018. Generally, it's presented on 12th. The entire process starts six months in advance, where the Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance sends out a circular to all the government departments to estimate what would be their income and what would be their expenditure for the for ensuing year. In addition to that, they also engage themselves and have a lot of meeting with various stakeholders. It could be investors, 
including the regulators like the Securities Exchange Board of India, the Reserve Bank of India, the Institute of Chartered Accounts of India. They also speak to SEBI. They have a lot of meetings wherein each of these organizations, the trade bodies, are asked to send pre-budget memorandum. A circular is sent to all of them, asking them, if you have any suggestions for the coming budget, please send in your pre-budget memorandum. Being the president of the Institute of Chartered Accounts of India, I've, I was closely involved in one particular budget wherein we were asked to give the entire recommendations by the Institute of Chartered Accounts of India for the budget. And we send in all our recommendations to the government well in advance. And we get these recommendations from the members of our institute. As you know, we have 2,50,000 chartered accountants and 8 lakh students across the country. We have a process where online members can give in their you know, views on what the budget should be. We collate all this information and pre-budget recommendations are sent by the Institute of Chartered Accounts of India to the Ministry of Finance. Similarly, you have CII, the Confederation of Indian Industry, you have ASOCHEM, you have various other trade bodies in the country which provides the inputs for preparing the budget. Once all the stakeholders provide the inputs, there's a team in the Ministry of Finance that looks into each and every recommendation that has been made. They have various inputs that have received from various departments of the government and then they go about working, making out this exercise. The entire process is confidential and all the officials in the Ministry of Finance who are involved in the presentation of the budget have to be, you can say, closeted for a period of 15 to 16 days just before the budget is announced. If you have visited the Ministry of Finance, you can see very well the entire basement in the Ministry of Finance is earmarked for this activity. There is absolutely no way anyone can enter that. And all the senior officials of the Ministry of Finance stay in that particular place in the, uh, you know, uh, the Ministry of Finance and the budget is printed and the entire formulation takes place in this particular um, uh, ministry. In addition to this, they also have consultations. The Finance Minister, Mr. Arun Jaitley, would speak to the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi. He would like to see what are, what are his views as to how he would like the budget to be. Modi being the Prime Minister of the country, the leader of the nation, who is looking at transforming India, would like to give some suggestion to Jaitley. I would like to give a push to the rural India. I would like to give a push to health. I would like to give encourage uh, agriculture. So whatever points that are given by the Prime Minister and the Cabinet is noted down by the Finance Minister. And if you have seen the last four budgets that have been presented by Ms. Arun Chetri, the fifth budget that is being presented, a thrust is given to certain areas in each budget. If you look into the thrust that is given in this year's budget, the Honorable Finance Minister Arun Jaitley has given a thrust to rural India, providing electricity connection, rural employment, agriculture, infrastructure development. More or less, you can say it's a populist budget and the budget has been well received. I am sure all of you have seen the experts' view on the budget. Most of the experts are very uh, rightly said that this budget is an election budget and this is being done uh, keeping in view the elections but whatever said and done I can say that I've read the budget I've read the fine print I can say it's a fine budget and each and every citizen of this country would be immensely benefited by this budget so when I take you through the various uh, sectors of the economy how it would get impacted you'll understand how this budget has far-reaching impact for each of each one of us sitting here Friends, I'm sure all of you would agree with me that India is on the fast track of economic development. And all of us should be fortunate to be a part of this revolution because most of you sitting here would be heading top companies in the country. You'll be CFOs of various corporates. You'll be the director of finance of various corporates. And it is essential for you to understand how this budget document would impact each and every one of us. Because tomorrow when you are the CFO of a company, you need to understand the fine print of this budget. So it is essential that right from today, as Vinay very rightly said, you need to start reading the union budget fine print from this year itself. So by the time you get into a job, by the time you start assuming responsibilities, you have the entire budget document under your control. If you look at the GDP that has been uh, projected for, your, for the year 2017, <coughs> It is expected to be at 6.7% and it is likely to reach 7.2% to 7.5% in the year 2000, 
18, 19. I would not like to go into what GDP is. All of you are aware of it. The fiscal deficit is pegged at 3.3% of GDP, which is again very good. But yes, the government is trying to put a lot of efforts to re reduce the fiscal deficit. What do you mean by the fiscal deficit? It's a difference between the total revenue collection, the total revenue expenditure is the fiscal deficit. It's pegged at 3.3%. And what is very, very important, friends, is that today our economy is a $2.5 trillion economy. We are growing very fast, seventh largest economy in the world, and we are poised to be the fifth largest economy. And if you travel around the world, I had the opportunity to travel around the world to various countries when I was a president. What I could see was that India is looked upon with great interest around the world. And the way India is growing, let me tell you, in the years to come, not very surprising that we move up to the fourth, fourth position or the third position. But yes, as of today, we are on the fast track of economic development. Having said this, two major structural reforms that was taken up by the government last year, all of you are aware, November 8, 2016, when the demonetization was announced by the Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi, you saw the flurry of activity at your home. I'm sure your mother would, you know, would be running to her cupboard to pull out all the old notes she has kept it in her, uh, you know, um, in the locker. Your father would be busy trying to see how much how much he has to deposit in the cash, and each one of us would be excited with this development that took place. Let me tell you, friends, this is one initiative that was taken up by the new government that really created a huge impact. I think all of you saw the lines in front of the ATMs. If you go, if you went to rural India, the farmers used to just sleep in front of the ATM to draw money from the counters, to draw money from the cash. There was a cash shortage in the ATMs and most of the ATMs said no cash available. And there was a restriction on your withdrawals. So what really happened is that the government wanted to reduce the black money in circulation. They wanted to reduce the counterfeit notes. They wanted to see how best they can reduce the black economy in our country because traditionally as all of you know when you go to if you go to any business place you go to a place like chickpet if you're familiar with chickpet everything is available you know you can pay by cash they ask you you want a bill you don't want a bill and everything happens seamlessly so what really is happening today is that with the demonetization coming everyone is cautious today you go with five lakhs cash to the bank the lady in the counter will ask you, where did you get this file X? Do you have a PAN number? Have you linked your PAN number to your credit uh, to your bank account? So it's not very easy for you to deposit file X. And even if you want to withdraw three lakhs, you know, the lady in the counter starts looking at you. So there is a sort of a fear that has been put in by demonetization. And that is one big change I see because we deal with a lot of, you know, uh, tax SSCs who come to us especially the business people have been impacted by demonetization and one sector that got heavily impacted is the real estate sector today if you see in the real estate sector there are no buyers for flats many many flats are not are just you know available at discounted prices in a city like bangalore you don't you find that infrastructure development is not happening at the pace it which it should happen that is because of the fact that demonetization has removed the money in the system and currently as a director of the Indian Overseas Bank I have been appointed by the Ministry of Finance we found that a lot of money came into the banking system post demonetization when we were reviewing the performance of the bank we have what is known as a current account savings account ratio CASA ratio we found that our current account and savings account balances across the bank had gone up so this goes to prove that today everything is getting channelized but as you know, Indians are smart. Indians are capable of trying to, you know, even try to see how best they can evade the tax. But one thing that has happened in demonetization, it has brought in a lot of fear in the businessmen that they have to do the business in the right way. Then the next big change that happened was GST. GST, I think all of you are aware, it's now a part of your curriculum. All the, it's a new legislation that was brought in all the levies under indirect like excise everything was subsumed into one tax and you had the local vat you had excise duty you had octroi 
service tax everything got merged into gst and today one nation one tax the government wants to see that this is a success earlier i'm i'm sure when you used to go on the highways you see you used to see a lot of trucks parked near the check post all the check posts have vanished today there are no check posts anywhere in the country today the travel time for goods to reach from let us say a city like bangalore to delhi would be maybe 30 30 35% would be the saving so the seamless what you can say movement of goods across the country because of gst and one of the major reasons why gst was introduced was that to remove the cascading effect of taxation so each one of us get a benefit when you buy a soap if it was costing 10 rupees earlier it should it will cost you 8 rupees now everything has gone down and the government is trying to see how best gst is a big success i would like to say that gst is one big reform that will benefit the country that will benefit each one of us and it is our duty to see how best we can play a role in see in seeing that gst is a success friends uh, two important things uh, that i would like to share is that because of gst the tax base has increased there's a 50% increase in the tax base everyone is keen to get themselves registered in the gst they would like to issue bills for whatever sale that is made and i'm sure when you go to any place to buy you would ensure that you would like to have a bill where the customer the trader has paid the gst foreign direct investments yes today we have lot of appetite for foreign direct investments that has gone up taxation base has increased greater push for digitization prime minister modi is keen that this should be a cashless economy today you have so many apps digital apps where you can make payments even if you want to buy a tender coconut you can pull out your paytm and then flash it to the guy and the guy gladly accepts uh, your paytm payments so you have the beam app where you have multiple bank accounts on your mobile phone you can decide where you can make the payment from the banks across the country have been instructed by the government to see that they give a big push for digitization not only in india uh, urban india but also rural india so what would happen for all of you is that with digitization you have the evolution of fintech companies financial services and technology getting integrated today there are plenty of job uh, job opportunities for all, all of you in the fintech space the moment you finish your mcom the moment you finish your mba the moment you finish your bcom if you are not interested to do ca the best thing for you is to get into a fintech company if you see the advertisements in the paper there are so many opportunities in the fintech space and i request each one of you present here that if you are looking for a career in the fintech space it's an exciting opportunity for you to get into the space the government has given a big push for digitization and i'm sure each one of us would be benefited in this change that is taking place in the economy recapitalization of public sector banks today public sector banks require money what is happening is the public sector banks is lending money we have lot of willful defaulters people who borrow money from the bank rather than using it for running their business they use for foreign travel they use for investing in real estate they divert the funds they are not able to pay up to the bank as a result of which the non performing assets of each of the public sector bank every year is increasing all of you have seen the classic case of uh, kingfisher airline where so much of money was borrowed from all the public sector banks and today the government is trying it best to see how best it can uh, you know uh, bring the money back into the banks so what is really happening is that the government is introducing lot of money into the banks to make it much healthier because one big concern for the public sector banks today is that mounting nps then we have the insolvency and bankruptcy code i am given to understand that way forward that will be integrated in your course that will change the whole dynamics of the way the lender and debtor relationship happens manufacturing sector is on a growth path and today we find that a whole lot of activity is happening in india and in this change that is taking place i think this budget has given a thrust for growth revitalizing rural and fiscal economy agriculture infrastructure health and education what i plan to do in the next few slides is that i'll just take you to the main important things i've just put up this slide for you to read it what the government plans to do is that ev today as you know those days we had the agricultural revolution like today have how we have the fintech revolution we had the agricultural revolution prime minister modi knows that today majority of the citizens of our country are still dependent on agriculture 
I'm sure whenever you go on the countryside, you see how many people are involved in agriculture, how many families are dependent on agriculture. So they want to improve this sector. They want to ensure that whatever revenue per acre of land that is being generated is more than more than double what they're earning today. They want to also want to see they get higher price realization. If you go to a country like Japan, you'll be surprised to know when you go on those bullet trains, the trains go at a very high speed. You can see so many pieces of land where automated machinery is being used uh, to, you know, what you can say, to produce wheat or rice. And today, if you take a country like Japan and take a country like India, the production that, that takes place in one piece of land in Japan is four times a, the same piece of land in India. So the government is keen to see that the price realization from each acre of land is more. They want to see how the production can be improved in that particular piece of land. They want to support them by providing them with loans. They want to you know, institutionalize agriculture finance. And today we find that a whole lot of technology is being used. The government is keen to set up warehouses. They want to give them information that is useful to them to predict what the prices is. Today, if a farmer has grown onions or potatoes and if he's harvesting let us say at the end of this month he would like to know what would be the prices so everything is getting automated you have the enam network national agriculture market where the farmer sitting at the comfort of his home will know what will be the prices of onions and potatoes the coming week he can store it he can warehouse it he can sell it in the market a whole lot of changes are taking place in the agricultural space and i believe that Considering the fact that India is an agricultural economy, a lot of impetus is required and very rightly the government has done it. Coming to the rural economy, whole lot of toilets. I was involved in an NGO. If you go to a, a place like Devanahalli, you will be surprised to know absolutely no toilets for the school children. Very close to the airport, I happened to be to a rural school. When I spoke to the teacher there and we asked her, why is it the attendance is less? She was telling me, Mr. Raghu, we have a lot of girls. The girls are not able to come to school because we don't have toilets. And the government is keen to see that how best more and more toilets can be constructed. They want to give a thrust for providing LPG connections to all the rural poor and construction of rural household. And what is really happening is that today, rural India requires a lot of support. There's so much of opportunity for each one of us to play a role in trying to see how best we can transform rural India. Education, very rightly, the government has given a thrust for education. All of you have heard of Prima Jai Kumar. She was a daughter of an auto rickshaw driver. She got the first rank in CA final. She wanted to bring about a transformation in the family. She said, my father has been an auto rickshaw driver, driving an auto ride from morning till night. Can I bring about a transformation in my family? And she wanted to do CA, she did CA, she became a chartered accountant. What I mean to say is that education can transform the life of each one of you sitting here. A high quality education from a reputed college, a reputed institute would bring about a big change. Even to this day, when I go somewhere, when I say I am from St. Joseph's College of Commerce, let me tell you friends, people are very, very happy to know that I am from a reputed college in Bangalore. All of you will have the same advantage the rest of your life. When you say that you are a student of St. Joseph's College of Commerce, people will, people will look upon with high esteem. Having said this, the government has given a very good impetus for education because if one person in the family is educated, the entire family can be transformed. Yesterday, I happened to meet a friend who was from Rajasthan he said, Raghu, my family comes from a rural family. We have agricultural family. I was only child account in my family. I have three sisters and two brothers. We have absolutely no money to even run our family. The moment I became a CA, there's a complete transformation that took place in my family. So one educated individual in one family can bring about a big change. So the government has tried to see how best this can be achieved. They've tried to integrate the, B, the, the Bachelor of Education program so that the quality of teaching improves because quality of teaching, when we talk about teaching, we just can't talk about teaching in reputed colleges. You have to look at the teaching at the rural schools and the rural colleges. They plan to do that. They plan to set up a railway university, 18 schools of planning and architecture and blackboard to digital board. Gone are the days where you have a chalk piece to be used to write uh, the whole thing. 
the entire country is moving to a digitization and they're very rightly they're using the new portal diksha to see how best you know education can be delivered using online services and in the ce institute we utilize a lot of technology we have a mobile app we have a e learning course and st jude's college of commerce also has taken the lead to see how best technology can be used to provide the quality education to the students health is one big change that has taken place the entire budget today is focusing on health i'm sure all of you would agree with me you go to a hospital like manipal you go to a hospital like columbia asia you go to a hospital like uh, fortis uh, even for a 3 day hospitalization you have to end up spending 2 lakh rupees if there is a major surgery that takes place like a open heart surgery or you know a kidney transplant it will run to 5 to 7 lakhs tell me how many of the middle class families can afford this kind of hospitalization today very honestly i can tell you friends every individual the moment he crosses 50 is bothered about his health then we look it looks into his bank balance he find that he is not had, having adequate bank balance to take care of his health very rightly the government has stepped in and they have said we would like to support and almost 10 crore families would be benefited and the insurance coverage would be filed 50 crore population would be covered i think this is one big push given by the modi government in if at all if i would like to compliment mr modi for one big change that he has brought about it is for this change mr modi has brought in wherein he is keen to see that how best this is a big success but yes implementation is not easy implementation is tough and if you have seen the panel discussion that took place on the day of the budget we had the chairman and managing director of medanta hospital medanta is one of the top hospitals in delhi where you know not even middle class not even a high, you know, upper middle class can afford a hospitalization there he was telling me there's lot of spare capacity in this premium hospitals let it be super speciality speciality hospitals and any of the hospitals there's a spare capacity of 30 to 40% he said if the government can work with us we can ensure that 30% capacity is used to provide healthcare for the common man so this is one big i can say uh, credit that goes to modi for giving in healthcare for almost 50 crore families that is the reason it's called as ayushman bhava budget and um, in addition to that they also planning to set up number of medical colleges and they want to also set up more than 150000 wellness centers what do you mean by wellness center today because of various reasons people have diseases you can say the number of people having diabetic is so high in a country like india a wellness center is something that can guide them and help them to manage the disease better 150000 wellness centers across the country would try to see how best each of the women or men in the uh, in a in the particular village can go and reach out and get free drugs free treatment and this is something which the government has uh, really uh, done a good job infrastructure i think we have the best airports in the country, in the world do you agree with me i'm sure the, the kind of travel what all of you have done we have never traveled the first time i traveled in a aircraft was after i finished my ca can you believe it i qualified as a chartered accountant in 1990 and immediately after i finished my chartered accountancy i had an opportunity to go for an audit and i had to fly air india and that was a big thing getting a ticket and then trying to reach the airport well in advance flying for the first time but today you find that you know people fly it's very common for any for you know people to fly and they are keen to come up with more air connectivity and if you see the airports in india whether it's a delhi airport the calcutta airport the bangalore airport i can tell you state of that i have seen airports in many countries and today our airports are extremely good they have leapfrogged you can say like how telecom we are leapfrogged like if you use a telephone in us and use of telephone in india it's the same there's no big change whether you're using data in us or here except for maybe a very small difference the speed i think more or less the experience is the same so we find that infrastructure is very critical for the growth of the economy you need to have good airports you need to have good metro stations you need to have good roads metro stations today most of this, i was in lucknow last month i was very happy to see in a place like lucknow such a good metro system is coming so many many big cities in the country are having state of the art metro systems and the bharatmala project which plans to link all the interior roads the border roads is something very good and i'm sure the smart cities is something which is something which all of us should look for because everything would be connected 
the moment you enter your house you have a automatic uh, uh, you know a sensor that can detect and the garage door opens up and you can put your car the moment you enter your portico your door opens everything would be automated the houses also in the smart cities would be automated you have the best architects of the world working on this project and 100 smart cities would come up in the next 5 to 6 years but 10% of the work has happened 90% of the work is yet to happen so infrastructure is very critical for the growth of the economy so ports airports roads smart cities are something which are very critical the government has given a big push for all these sectors these are some of the other things wi-fi hotspots wi like wi-fi hotspots to provide broadband to rural citizens digital india program all this is something very important msme today you talk about medium and small enterprises india has got a lot of small enterprises we were just discussing not everyone can get into a job in infosys or wipro you can get a job in an msme also you go to pinya there's so many successful enterprises having a turnover of 500 crores, 1000 crores. But all of us look at Infosys, we look at Wipro, we look at MNCs, we look at Standard Chartered Bank, we look at getting into, you know, all the big listed companies. But there are a lot of opportunities for the commerce students, each one of you in the MSME space in India. Because if you see the kind of demand for finance professionals, the MSME space is very high. The government wants to encourage that. They want to provide loan sanction, online loan sanctioning facility, startups, India is the startup capital of the world. If you see a city like Bangalore, the kind of startups what you have, so many startups come up every day and they're looking at funding, venture capital funding, looking at angel investors. The government wants to set up a mechanism for that. And today, what is also happening is that they want to see that the EPF contribution rate from 12% to 8% for women employees for the first three years. If you go to Australia, you'll be surprised. Today, I'm, let us say I'm having a lack of rupees. What I do, I either put it in a fixed deposit and I find the rate of return is very low. So what do I do? I put it in a mutual fund, which has got a better return. But yes, of course, there's no protection on your capital. Then I think of real investing in real estate. But it one lakh can I invest in a flat? I can't even look at a flat for investing in one lakh. In Australia, what they've done is they've come out with what is known as the BRICS exchange. Let us say Prestige has got a big project of 1,000 flats coming up in Whitefield and you're keen to invest in that flat, but each flat costs three crores. You have just 30 lakhs with you. What do you do? Today, we know that the cost of the flat is three crores. You see your bank balance, you have just have 30 lakhs. You shy away from it. Am I right? But in Australia, what they've done is, even for a guy who's got 30 lakhs, he can invest in the BRICS exchange. They've created what is known as BRICS as a unit. So let us say a flat will have about 10,000 bricks, each brick is valued. So you can buy 30 lakhs worth of bricks in that particular project and this bricks is traded on the stock exchange. So I can still invest 30 lakhs in that particular project and tomorrow for some reason my daughter is getting married, I can disinvest and maybe get a appreciation on that particular bricks. So these are all the new funding innovation, innovation that is happening around the world. I think the government is keen to introduce all this. We'll have the BRICS exchange, you will have the exchange for small and medium enterprises. All this would uh, augur well for the economy. Direct taxes, nothing much has been done because last two, three years, many changes have taken place. Everyone thought exemption limit would increase. Jaitley said, nothing doing. We have given you sufficient exemptions. Be happy. And um, the direct tax collections have gone up. Taxpayers have also increased from 6.47 to 8.27. One thing, friends, I would like you to keep in mind that in India, there's a lot of people who don't file their tax returns. They have rental income, they don't want to file tax returns. They have in income from fixed deposits, they don't want to file tax returns. They sell properties, they don't want to file tax returns. So the government is trying to plug, they're trying to use data analytics. I can say this budget, if I see, government has used extensive technology to mine the data to find out how many of them are paying uh, filing the returns how many of them are paying taxes how many of them are not paying see the number of taxpayers have increased absolutely no changes in the tax rates education sets has increased from three percent to four percent and long-term capital gains as you know how the but uh, how the stock markets have worked last two three days you've seen and today this morning was just coming driving down to your college 1200 points the stock markets have tanked today that is because of not only this because of global uh, the new york stock exchange has tanked so even the bs uh, the, the bombay the, the um, nse has also come down so here what is happening is the long-term category of sale of listed securities will be taxed at 10 percent if 
the gain exceeds 1 lakh. Domestic companies that are small companies having a turnover of 250 crores and less, instead of 30% they pay 25%. Deemed dividend under 222E has been brought in. Then all trust today, any payment make, being made by more than 10,000 rupees, they need to make it by, they cannot make it by cash. If they make it by cash, it will be disallowed. And a lot of new things have been made. Assessments have been electronic. The moment you file your tax return, everything is processed automatically. You don't need to go to the income tax department. You don't get a notice where you just go and meet the income tax officer and provide all the details. Today, even the top celebrities like Amitabh Bachchan would fear to get an income tax notice. That is the kind of fear that is generated by the income tax department. You take the top cricketers, you take the top politicians, you take the top uh, film actors. Everyone dreads to get a tax notice. You agree with me? So now they want to remove all this. They said no more tax notices. Everything will be electronic. We'll ask you some questions. You submit all the questions. We'll complete the assessment. So they want to make it more tax friendly. You know, each of the initiatives that has been done by the government to see how best you can get the returns process. Standard deduction increase has been brought in. 40,000 for salaried employees and pensioners. And senior citizens' income on deposit with banks and posts are exempted for 50,000. Today, friends, Many of the senior citizens are dependent on fixed deposits. You just speak to your dad. He will say, I am having 50 lakhs fixed deposit. I will get 6-7% return of income. I have retired from, the, from my job and this is my income. The government is keen to see to give them an additional benefit because the return on investments on FD is very low. Senior citizen health insurance premium has been increased from 30 to 50. And in respect of critical illness, 60 to 1 lakh under 80 DDB. All these sections are very important. You will have questions coming in your exams. So please don't take it lightly. ATC, ATD, ATDDD. All these are very relevant. And most of the teachers, when they send the examination paper, they'll pick up the new section. So you have to have a watch on all the new sections. 100% tax reduction for first five years to companies registered as pharma producer companies. Finally, friends, I would just like to conclude by saying yes, this is an exciting budget, a budget that would help each one of us, that would really help low cost, you know, education, health, infrastructure that we have all seen. And one big thing which the government has said is they want to create centers of excellence for artificial intelligence, robotics and blockchain. Today is the age of robotics. In the years to come, you will have robots punching accounting data. Those days, we used to have accountants, you know, writing the day book and ledger. When we completed our graduation, when I did my graduation, I used to come to St. Joseph's College of Commerce uh, with a, you know, what do you say, accounts book, ledger book. I'm sure you're, you're carrying it even now. And the accounts teacher used to insist, without that, we used, we used to ask you, please go. And then uh, we used to, you know, carry those books. Today, everything is computerized. You have a lot of accounting software where you just key in the data, everything is, day book, ledger is prepared. Now with blockchain, what is happening is that you go to a bank, let us say you give a check across a counter, the lady sitting at the counter will see you want to draw 50,000 rupees, she'll check whether you got a balance, she'll authorize it. You'll go to another officer who will check whether what the lady has done, checked is the right thing. In a blockchain technology, simultaneously multiple people can see your account. The lady who is checking your, uh, you know, the first the lady who, to whom you make the payment, uh, you pass on the check, who checks it. Simultaneously, the other guy can authorize it. Within split seconds, you can withdraw your amount. So blockchain is coming in a big way and the banking sector is embracing blockchain technology. And all the public sector banks have been asked to adopt blockchain. Artificial intelligence, again, like Siri, all of you are using, do you use Siri on your iPhones? So you can get a lot of information. You want to know the best restaurant. You have Siri telling you, go to you know Lakeview for ice cream and things like that. So blockchain technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, everything would impact each one of your data analytics. The kind of job opportunities in data analytics are excellent. They're creating centers of excellence so that students who have passed BCom, MCom, MBA, who want to have specialized knowledge, can do in the center of excellence. And finally, friends, I can just uh, tell you that uh, you know all these um, would uh, really help the country and this is the snapshot, I am not going into the details, this is something which you need to have and have a look at it that will give you what is the fiscal deficit, primary deficit, revenue receipts, capital receipts, expenditure, the whole snapshots you get it in uh, 
a nutshell. And finally, friends, I would like to thank all of you for having given me a patient hearing. And uh, only one suggestion to you, since all of you are, uh, you know, completing your graduation shortly, maybe one year, two years from now, I can tell you, you're all extremely lucky. Why you're lucky is that you're getting into the, you know, um, once you finish, you get into a job or you set up your own practice or whatever it is, you're getting into the right time. When there's a revolution that's taking place in India, a digital revolution is taking place in India, and all of you are extremely lucky to be a part of this revolution. Thank you. Oh, we'll be having a question and answer session now. Does anyone have any questions? You please uh, give your name, which class? Uh, I'm Sakshi, I'm from GBBA. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you which class of economy do you think is the most affected with the budget? Or which sector is most affected with the budget? Uh, you, you see. If you ask me which is a sector that is not happy with the budget, it is a salaried class who is not happy because no additional deductions and I am sure all of you would agree with me, your teachers are agreeing with me, they are not very happy, absolutely no benefits that have been given to them. And all individuals, they were thinking the exemption limit would go up, that has not uh, gone up. And uh, of course, um, you know, if you look at uh, the way the whole budget has been structured, it has been structured keeping in view the elections in mind. And when elections are round the corner, one year from now, it's very, uh, that is how most of the budgets, if you've seen the budgets that have been announced in the past, the last budget of any government would be populist, and they would not bother much about uh, the, you know, uh, you can say urban, they would look at uh, giving a push to rural India. Yeah. yeah. Sir, I'm talking from the Sir, in the same financial year, there's been a lower neighbor that's happened. There's also a lot of talk about bad credit agriculture among farmers. And you can see in the budget again that they've increased the credit for farmers again in agriculture. Don't you think that's actually the government saying it's okay to have bad credit culture and not be doing anything about it? I fully agree with you. If you, if you have done, uh, if you have gone to any rural bank, let us say you're coming from a, you know, any of your uh, going, uh, whenever you visit your hometown, you should go and visit the rural bank. Most of these rural banks, the lending is to the farmers. And the biggest disadvantage that is happening today in rural India is that the loans that are being taken by the farmers are not being utilized for the purpose for which it is borrowed. And many a times we see that it is being diverted by the farmers. Many farmers use that money for, you know, various other things. See, the government is keen to see to support the sector. Of course, as you rightly said, loan waivers are very common. Because, you know, in order to get oats from the farmers, they say, okay, fine, you have borrowed 20,000 rupees, we are waiving it. And as a result of which, the farmer looks at the wave, loan waiver every time. The moment he borrows, he knows that he is not paying it. This is something which, uh, uh, you know, like, this is a, you can say, a bane in our country. And uh, only if the collection mechanism is strong, if the farmers believe that, yes, we need to contribute back to the bank, things should improve, or else we have to live with this problem, where there are a lot of, you know, NPAs in the farm loans in the country. Sir, there's also been a lot of talk after this budget that the fiscal deficit might even go to 3.5%. Normally, a higher fiscal deficit means a bad credit score internationally. So, doesn't that normally mean the 
foreign investment may decrease. Isn't that correct? The government is keen to bring down the fiscal deficit. That is the endeavor of any government to see how best they can reduce their expenditure, increase their revenues. The government is banking upon indirect taxes. See, today, if you look into the entire revenue receipts in the union budget document, you have almost 40% coming in from direct taxes, other 40, 40 to 45% coming from indirect taxes. When we talk about indirect taxes, it's GST. Direct taxes, it's income tax. Now, the government is trying to increase the tax base more number of taxpayer more tax comes in so what is really happening is that if they want to reduce a fiscal deficit they have only two options increase the revenue by way of direct taxes or indirect taxes or reduce the expenditure and as you know if you if you have seen in the past revenue expenditure the government is not able to reduce. It is absolutely insufficient, whatever is being budgeted itself. So their focus is always trying to maximize revenue. In addition to that, they also have inflows coming from disinvestment. As you know, this time they've done a record disinvestment. And in the next year, the government is planning for another round of 80,000 crores of disinvestment. And the first one to be on the list is Air India. Air India is something which the government is keen to, you know, make three subsidies and sell it off. So what is happening is that until and unless the government doesn't increase the revenue, reduce expenditure, the fiscal deficit would stay at 3.2 to 3.5. So the only way the government can do is to increase the tax buoyancy and that can happen with more number of taxpayers uh, coming in. And I'm sure with GST coming in this year, the, f the complete benefits of demonetization and GST would be seen in this particular year, 2018-19. So thank you very much. On behalf of St. Joseph's College of Commerce, I would like to thank C.A.K. Raghu for his valuable insight and analysis of the union budget. Thank you so much, sir. It was a thought-provoking session, and I'm sure we will pay more attention in the future to budgets of the coming years, and also keep abreast with financial topics. I would also like to thank the OSA for organizing this session. Thank you so much.